Namaste. We are trying to have a glimpse of Shirobindo's life through his poems. And the reason why we have chosen this medium or rather have been inspired to choose this medium is because uh, this takes us right to the core of the person. Otherwise, we are only talking about events, circumstances on the surface. But what is happening inside, we don't know. And that is what the person is. So in every life we see, every human life, we see these three things which are there together. One is the surface personality. Surface personality is formed by all kinds of outer world forces, purely outer world forces. Our heredity, constitution, childhood experiences with parents, uh, education, friends, everything outside, you know. We study, we, we meet, we go to school, we have our teachers, all the conditioning that forms our outer personality. It's about the way we dress, the way we speak, the way we even certain kind of not attitudes, but the way we habitually respond to life. Behind this is the inner personality, which is the true personality within us. Inner personality is a place where the two currents meet. One is the contact of the world forces and the other is the psychic which throws its light in that area and it's a constantly in formation. So outer personality is what most of us see unfortunately and believe to be the true person. But uh, as we know it doesn't uh, go beyond uh, even one lifetime, within one lifetime. But usually after a lifetime it just left left outside. All these things we give so much importance to outer deeds and all this. But the real thing is what is happening inside. That is the inner being. It will, it's, it will be absorbed back into the psychic. Its essence will be taken back so that new, the unfinished curves of evolution, so that in next life, one can continue with these unfinished curves. Outer is gone, it's broken. That's what we give so much importance to, unfortunately. And behind the inner being, we see the person. So we see in Shurabindu's life, host of outer events, but through all this, we see primarily two aspects which are very prominent which is what we see in his writings Brahma Tej and Shatra Tej so Brahma Tej is the uh, will for knowledge, the power of knowledge and he says that I have got this power with which I am going to fight and that's what probably in the image of Kalki Avatar we see the sword of knowledge which Kalki carries on a white horse which is force so Brahma Tej and Shatra Tej so Brahma Tej is the force of knowledge which is so evident throughout in Shubindu's writings and the Shatra Tej, which uh, can fight a million obstacles, battles, uh, within and without. So these two things we see. But as in ordinary life, normally we stay on the surface. Time to time the inner personality shows up. But in great lives, that's what we see. The inner current tends to emerge more and more prominent till finally it overtakes. And that we, it's like the chick in the egg. The whole world changes the moment chick emerges out of the egg. So in Shubindu's life also we see, right, even from childhood, the inner current is very strong throughout. That's what we have been, you know, reading and sharing. And then we see it begins to emerge. And as it presses to the surface, uh, we see that, uh, you know, for him, his personal life, its enjoyments, pleasures have no meaning, no place. His life is given to something much greater, much higher. Uh, it's the liberation of his nation. And for that, he depends not on his own power, but on the power of the Divine Mother. And last time we read about Shobindo's Bhavani Bharti, where he invokes Kali. Not invokes, he says Kali has come and we have to respond to her call. And as he goes further and further, we see this inmost self, which is the Divine Himself who has assumed a human form, that begins to emerge. And that we see while in the course of the revolution, he does, he lays down all that is necessary for independence. Many people don't realize that, you know, they think uh, he was there for five years. Uh, rest of the work, majority work was done by somebody else. We don't realize that uh, sometimes one small little idea can change life. Now the person who gave the idea is the originator. You can't have the idea. Rest is all question of working out. That's how I understood yesterday what you know you were speaking about that sometimes for the logo, just the idea, there is a heavy money charged. 
and the reason is it's not easy to get the idea now that idea may be nothing compared to you know what somebody else may look at it but that idea the power of the idea this is something shubindu writes in vande matram he says the deports don't understand that idea carries a power and while you can suppress the outer unless you tackle the idea it will create new beings new instruments so shubindu had released in the freedom movement the core ideas which will lead us to independence he had given us inwardly to worship the country as mother not just land but not even mother land but as a goddess devi and that's what we see in number of his uh, writings bhavani bharati especially which we read last time and durga stroth and then he had also showed the path that india must take that path had to be a kind of spiritual revolution so it was not uh, the the typical way in which we fight revolutions that was not india's path india's path was spiritual revolution that means we should gather within ourselves the spiritual force and that's why when he withdrew he says that this is not how it will come the leaders have to be deeply they have to be yogis basically use the word that they should be yogis then only um, the true rise will happen otherwise anyways india is destined to rise but you'll see all these curves up and down up and down till you have real yogins and the third was he gave outer instruments all the things which later were used purna swaraj then passive resistance boycott swadeshi all these things are there in shurbindo's uh, writings the only thing he didn't use the word is non violence and unfortunately of all the ideas which are picked up later on there was a fetish made of non violence because for sure bindo it was not about violence or non violence it was the inner state which mattered so other than that everything else and unfortunately people gave so much importance by non violent means it's not that it was those ideas which should been that released passive resistance boycott in fact he has written so much on boycott etc so a time came when everything that was necessary was done and now uh, the divine had brought him to a point where or let's say that you know right now we still use the word in duality the divine had brought him to the point where he had to become the instrument of a much greater work and so he is brought to the seclusion of the jail and before that he had a very transmuting experience so just before we touch that experience because very often people ask i can't quiet in my mind so many thoughts so many thoughts so many thoughts how to quiet and how to quiet in simple answer not long answer that do a 10 day course and all that huh simple answer mind is like a monkey so you cannot make a monkey sit quiet but you can hand over the rope of the monkey to the madari to the man who makes the monkey dance so what it means to hand over the rope to the monkey it is to give it to god let him be the madari there is a line in ramayana no sabahi nachavat ram gusai ultimately he makes us dance so the moment we hand over then the monkey gets trained when the madari says sit he sits you see the monkey becomes such a good fellow and that monkey has now the potential to become hanuman the divine worker so let this mind be placed in the service of god in the seeking for god surrender to god and when we do that then slowly there comes a great inner liberation and all that we seek how to silence the mind people teach whole lot of techniques mind is like a monkey you can't teach it techniques for some time it will be quiet but it will dance again because it has not found its channel so we see some of these poems we can already see some of these touches that began to come to shurbindo so when he had gone to kashmir we spoke about it he had the advaita experience of the vacant infinite while walking on the seat of solomon so actually when you walk it's like a ridge and you see a whole vacant space around so he had the experience of the infinite this is the beauty of um see those who are marked for spiritual life they will find the divine symbol presence in everything and those the other kind even when they see the divine they'll see oh he is uh, like us two eyes one nose two ears what so special about him krishna is just a cow herdsman because that's how they will see it but to the man who spiritual eyes open all is krishna so this is the difference that so advaita is one of those i'll not read it but along with that we see 
Shobindu is not only withdrawing towards you. There is a kind of advaita where you withdraw from the world. Oh, there is a vacant infinite, so you withdraw. But Shobindu's life, he says, constantly, all the time, he says, my life has never been this worldly or that worldly. There has always been a beautiful synthesis. And then he says, from the time I landed up in uh, Apollo Bandar, I had both this worldly and other worldly experiences. And in that other worldly, he sees simultaneously the passive side and the dynamic side. So on one side, he had the experience with Lele Maharaj of that utter quietude, that nirvana, that stillness. And at the same time, after that, he went to Pune and uh, Bombay. Girgaon and there he you know in Pune there is this Saras Bagh so you have Parvati hill on where there is a stone goddess Parvati temple and he climbed the steps so there he had the vision of the world mother both aspects the passive and the dynamic throughout we find in Shurbindo's writings because he gave importance to this world play so we will first read the stone goddess or maybe just the a line a few lines from Advaita and then the stone goddess and then we'll build up. Around Now this experience can easily, many people would feel this is the ultimate Vedantic experience. But the beauty of Sri he saw that as long as I am having even spiritual experiences from the seat of mind, they will remain incomplete. This is another very unique thing about Sri that while the lens is the mind, that's why even a great spiritual experiences, experience splits the world into two. Because it's operating through the mind. Mind is a lens which divides. So even when you see the divine or feel that formless solitude, you feel, oh, that is real, this is unreal. They are two different orders of reality. You don't arrive at the real oneness which ultimately Advaita should be. So this is an early experience where he speaks about I walked on the high weight seat of Solomon where Sankracharya's tiny temple stands facing infinity from time's edge alone on the bare ridge ending earth's vain romance. So you see the Sankracharya comes in. But what is this earth? When you look at that vacant infinity it looks like this is uh, nothing. That is the real uh, truth. Around me was a formless solitude. All had become one strange, unnameable, an unborn soul reality, world nude, topless and fathomless, forever still. This is 1901. So when people speak about Nirvana, which is 1908, they must know what is traditionally described as Nirvana. This is the experience, Advaita Nirvana. He had it way back. Even when he was not really consciously practicing yoga. The experience he has later on given words much later. But this was the experience. A silence that was being's only word. The unknown beginning and the voiceless end. Abolishing all things. Moment seen or heard. On an incommunicable summit reigned. This experience is described by Sri in Savitri in book 2. In the self of mind. Where suddenly, you know, there is the mind becomes a hush and there is the self of mind. Still, through the mind, we are witnessing or experiencing the self. The witness spirit. But that other experiences in the pursuit of the, the pursuit of the unknowable. That's where you will find the other experience. Now, this is important because uh, we use a term, nirvana, nirvana. Now, when nobody knows nirvana, anybody can sell us brand nirvana. It's like when you don't know the original thing, no? So, Nike brands, unless you know that tick mark, that to how it is tick marked, any tick mark is, <laughs> I'm not doing any brand promotion. Better not speak about it. Okay, <laughs> so the point is we don't know that. So, anybody says, you know, you'll have the nirvanic experience. Now, why Shrivinda has taken great pains to explain all, reveal all this to us? So that we don't get stop in any halfway home of the spirit. And mind, this experience is formidable experience. Anybody after this experience would have a tendency to withdraw from the world. And Shobindo writes so humorously about the Maharaja, comes back to Baroda and he's doing everything. 
A lonely calm and void unchanging peace on the dumb crest of nature's mysteries. At the same time he has this experience there of the, uh, you know, he sees the image of Kali and that we have already uh, spoken about. But here I'll read about, this is one experience and then what he had sitting in a room in Baroda, that room is I think still preserved, there is a swing there and he was sitting there and Lili Mara, it's a wonderful place, actually the only place which after Pondicherry, here Shurabindo's room, if you really feel that atmosphere of Shurabindo in a room, it is Baroda where they have thankfully preserved that place in such a beautiful way that you feel that atmosphere. And of course, it's not where he sat in the swing, but where he stayed. But that house also, and that swing is kept there. So the experience of Nirvana, he describes, all is abolished, but the new mute alone. So one experience is where this world looks like unreal. It ends the vain romance and there is the sense of the silence, all pervading silence all around. And there is the nature at the crest you experience that great mystery. All is abolished but the mute alone, the mind from thought released, the heart from grief. So in the first experience you are still subject if you come back. So he has described this experience in what detail? There is a poem called Yogi on the Whirlpool. So everything is there below, but you are sitting atop. That's why many of these uh, ascetics used to withdraw from the world. Because they knew that if they come back and enter the world, they will be not just caught, but like, what was the term? Revenge tourism. So they will have a revenge, uh, you know, emergence of these vrittis. So those who are following this path of otherworldliness, please stick on to otherworldliness. Don't try to meddle with the world. The forces are too challenging to grapple. But those who are following the path of Krishna, come to the world and evolve through that process. That is the basic difference, the path of moksha. Then follow it to its utmost. because, And that's why they always maintain a certain kind of, you know, all kinds of barriers. So many of them take to an extreme path. So this is the experience of 1908 January. All is abolished, but the mute alone, the mind from thought released, the heart from grief, grow inexistent now beyond belief. The very mind, thought, the grief in the heart, they are all dead, they are gone. You can't, even if you search for it, you can't find it. That is the state. There is no I, no nature, known, unknown. Now one can see the first experience and compare it with this one. There is no I, no nature, known, unknown. The word I is used incidentally for the sake of convenience of expression. So it's not like somebody who has this experience of freedom will say, Oh, now I can't use the word I. So he'll say, you know, this body which is known as Mr. So-and-so, that is a hypocrite, that's... Not required. You don't have to prove a point by semantics. You know, like somebody sent once a marriage card to me. Priya Atman. This Atman is marrying that Atman. <laughs> and this Atman is requested to come here. All is Atman. So, <laughs> a good friend, I didn't know what to do. He was very influenced by Sri Ramakrishna, which is understandable. But Sri Ramakrishna would not say this. He rather said, if you start treating mentally that all is God, then the elephant um, will throw you off the road. So, you don't have to say this, but the sense of I with which we engage, that I is gone. It's no more that I. So, Anything that touches it goes on the surface and goes away. This comes with this experience. It doesn't go with the emergence of the psychic being. Psychic being brings out the true I. But the ego self remains as a per very weakened personality. The ego sense remains like a snake which can hiss but not bite. <laughs> so, one becomes benign. <laughs> one, one cannot harm. Things like which are, you know, those emotions which can harm, hatred, all this will go away from nature with the emergence of the psychic being. But still there will be a sense of I like a little thin personality. But with nirvana, this goes away completely. Then you don't write, you know, on a billboard holding Shri 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 I. 
because it's not required, you know, because <laughs> it's... <laughs> There is no I, no nature, known unknown. The city, a shadow picture without tone. This is what he experienced as soon as he went to Bombay. That experience kept deepening. And as he was on one of the buildings, the whole city was vanishing like a shadow. The city, a shadow picture without tone, floats, quivers unreal, forms without relief. Flow is cinema's weakened shapes. Like a reef foundering in shoreless gulfs, the world is done. This was the experience which he, uh, Swami Vivekananda had when Sri Ramakrishna just touched him. And everything vanished suddenly and uh, he suddenly wondered, where is I, where, is, where am I? So there was no I even sensed. But he had a work to do so he brought him back. And then later on when Swami Vivekananda wanted to have that experience, he said, no, I have logged and uh, given the key to mother. When you do the work, then she will hand over to you. You can't have that again. He, he, but he had given him that experience so that he is aware that there is something. Because he was asking questions. So he just touched him and gave that experience. Suddenly the world quivers and vanishes, which is so consistent with what science would itself tell us. It's all floating on a mass of energy and energy itself is vanishing into nothingness or apparent nothingness because there cannot be any true nothingness. Only the illimitable permanent, this is what the Buddha experienced, the illimitable permanent, is here. Only the illimitable permanent is here, a peace stupendous, featureless, still replaces all what once was I in it is silent unnamed emptiness content either to fade in the unknowable or thrill with the luminous seas of the infinite so this is where he sees this possibility this is what he describes in the pursuit of the unknowable where um, that last like a last wave it could either vanish or it could return back with a new mind and new body. So this is the experience which he has described here in a poem. This is the experience which deepened. And deepened to an extent where Shubindo experienced what is known as Parabrahman. So Parabrahman is also written before uh, his departure to Pondicherry. Though uh, in 1912 in one of the letters, uh, do we have it here? No. So though in 19, one of the letters... Yes. So, um, he writes uh, that uh, for 18 hours a day I can dwell now in Parabrahman. It's unimaginable. <laughs> that experience is, you know, Shubhinda in one of the places describes that people who had the glimpse of the Parabrahman, you can hurriedly glimpse it because it just takes you inside. You can't stand on the borders. It's like he says, you are running through a porch and for a moment the door opens and you look and you run away. Then only you can stay. Because if you look, you don't come back. That's how she, even Sri Ramakrishna described that experience. If you look to that side, haak or gire pade. So you walk on the edge. Don't look that side. If you look, that is so powerful. It, nothing can remain and it can draw you. Time, space, everything vanishes. We can't even imagine what humanity can realize. And he speaks of Parabrahman. The same experience is deepening. Advaita, Nirvana, Parabrahman. And what does he experience there? He sees everything is a divine moment. But again we see the unity of the static and the dynamic side. The self of things is not their outward view. A force within decides that force is he. His movement is the shape of things we knew. Movement of thought is space and time. A free and sovereign master of his world within. Now this is uh, where Sri Aurobindo writes in one of the aphorism. They told me that the end of everything is that uh, impersonal silence uh, of the unknowable. He says, I followed, went there. And then what does he discover? He says, I went there beyond and discovered my... Krishna with illimitable personality. We'll come to that experience. So this experience is deepening more and more. So as he enters, he discovers he, sir, evasha. That's how the Upanishad describes. Sir, that, he. 
And who is he? What is he? He is not bound by what he does or makes. He is not bound by virtue or by sin. Awake who sleeps. And when he sleeps, awakes. So this is all spiritual experiences, mystic experiences are described by paradoxes. So that we are awake in the to the outward world. But to the outward world that is asleep. And if you withdraw inside and enter into that which is the super conscious sleep, you become supremely awake. <laughs> so this is the whole mystery that he is describing. He is not bound by waking or by sleep. Don't think that he is not active in the outer world just because he is withdrawn in the super conscious hush. Mother describes it, uh, you know, she would soar into the supramental regions and people who were around didn't know what to do. So they used to do with Sri also. He would be gazing and looking at the wall and entering into that uh, state of infinity. And people would be reading newspaper and all this, you know. They didn't understand that what he is saying. Sri is a perfect gentleman, so he would not say anything. But mother once told them, you know, you think that I am not aware of what is happening outside? I am aware even of your thoughts, even of the clock, of the time and everything. And they realize that, okay, <laughs> we shouldn't understand. It's not like she's withdrawn now, so we can just do whatever. Sometimes she would be withdrawn for 45 minutes, one hour. And there are very beautiful stories with regard to that. Blessed are those, I have met one of them. So he would uh, tell me, uh, it was, uh, you know, that uh, Ganguly family, Jumardi, Chomdi's, uh, Sunil Das uh, brother. So, um, one of them was telling me, Kanak uh, Da, that, you know, he was standing to the mother. He says, she would suddenly go into trance. So, he says, she kept her hand on my shoulder and she went into trance. So, I said, what a blessed, let me touch your shoulder. <laughs> That's what I can do. So, he said, I said, how long? He says, 45 minutes. It was a blessed thing for me. He said, I couldn't imagine. Just imagine, mother has kept the hand and she's there. And she's fully aware. So I said, okay, let me <laughs> just do this much. <laughs> so this, this is how he is not bound by waking or by sleep. He is not bound by anything at all. Laws are that he may conquer them. To creep or soar is at his will. To rise or fall. You can't tie the vidhata to his own vidhan. He invariably tends to tweak them. That's, you know, one of the favorite two lines which I love. प्रबल प्रेम के पाले पढ़कर प्रभु को नियम बदलते देखा अपना मान रहे न रहे पर भक्त का मान न टलते देखा he is so much moved by love he changes the laws Arjun has decided I'll kill him or do Agni Snan he used to do something so he tweaks the material nature <laughs> he because uh, nothing is fixed in this creation the mother repeatedly tells us but we can't change it by wishful thinking she says nothing is fixed, it's all habit patterns. But to change it you have to get the, because everything is interconnected. You can't shift a needle without shifting everything in the cosmos, which is what modern physics also tells us. So you have to really change a law, you can change it. But you have to get the whole sanction from there. That is the only paradox because it's all one. Even the transcendent has not cut himself off. Yes, it can. there is a status in which one is beyond and yet he has become all this. One from of old possessed himself above, who was not anyone, nor had a form, non-being of the Rig Veda. Nor yet was formless, neither hate nor love could limit his perfection, peace, nor storm. So who is he? He says, he is, we cannot say. <laughs> neti, neti. But then can we say that he is not? He is, we cannot say. For nothing too is his conception of himself unguessed. When we don't guess him, when we don't know, then we say nothingness. But it is not nothing in the sense we understand. That's our problem of the words. Because out of nothing, only nothing can come out. Not everything. So nothingness is a state where the mind is baffled. It does, there is nothing which corresponds to the mind's cognate experience of reality. 
Even our highest conception cannot capture. It falls silent. That's what we see with Sri Aurobindo. It's completely silent. That's why some of the great yogis have said that, you know, there is no need of speaking. You have to arrive there. But in Sri Aurobindo's yoga, because everything has its place and uh, expression is one form of manifestation, therefore we see that it is permissible, provided it something which flows from above. So, he dawns upon us and we would pursue, but who has found him or what arms possessed? So there is an, another beautiful passage on Parbrahman. He says, do not say that you have possessed God, possessed Parbrahman, because you cannot. It is an impossibility. But you can be possessed by him, by it. That can drive you completely. He, and then those wonderful lines, he is not anything. Neti neti. Yet all is he. Iti iti. You and me and he and she and it and yonder burning star with all its splendor, that southern cross, the northern, uh, you know, that compass and the galaxies, the earth, the plants, the bushes, the stone lying idly on the seashore. The old man passing by, the little girl, the boy, smiling and running across. And ultimately, we ourselves are none else but he, in different figures. That's how he describes that beautiful meditation in the Upanishad. All this is he. Yet, he is not limited by it. You can't define it. The moment you try to define, I am God means I, this little personality is God, you lose it. So... He is not all, but far exceeds that scope. So you can't even say that, okay, he is everything means I calculate, add, all these things is mind. Many people do that, no? They say mental plus vital plus physical plus psychic plus spiritual. Then they also add plus supramental. That's where it collapses. <laughs> supramental is not a unit you can add. Supramental is everywhere. <laughs> Somebody asked, this, very, this was very... Interesting revelation to me when I had read it And it opened the doors of understanding many things Within the ashram context Someone asked Sri Aurobindo That what is there in the divine consciousness The mother's consciousness is everything Mental, vital, physical All beings, all creatures I said oh my god that explains everything To me it was like a ah moment Everything Why should it be like limited only to This kind or that kind And that would explain many things why that logic we don't understand But everything is there After all he is there even in the But he reveals himself based on Our limited conception That's a different thing But there is nothing which is void or devoid of him What about time and space Both time And timelessness Sink in that sea So we understand time And then we Think of timelessness Momentarily we may experience timelessness We may think it is eternity It's not eternity But there are moments When we lose completely the sense of time See time has an inner dimension Which is not usually mentioned The outer dimension of time is that Tick, 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 tick and you know all the things The inner dimension of time is When you are depressed Time moves very slowly Oof, When is it going to be over? When is it going to be over? And when you are happy, it's over so soon. So time has different connotations. There is a psychological time because it corresponds to time in different time-space scales. There are many time-space continuums. And then finally there is the timelessness where for a moment it vanishes. But he is beyond time and timelessness. Both time and timelessness sink in that sea. Time is a wave and space a wandering drop. And yet we say the mother of Sri Aurobindo Ashram Pondicherry. Sri Aurobindo was born on 15th August 1872. <laughs> when somebody asked Sri Aurobindo that it's okay your special darshan day but isn't it good if we live with this attitude that you know every day is your birthday. He said yes that is a perfect attitude. <laughs> Try living like that. And uh, that is the ultimate truth. What did Mother say about Sri birth? It is the birth of the eternal in time. 
and one place he says to celebrate the birth of a transit transient body may satisfy some faithful feelings but to celebrate the birth of a new world that's what should be the represents he has brought a new world and for that he had to traverse all these things all these states and domains of con consciousness conquered them like rishis of yore all this he had finished all that buddha could reach and beyond because uh, all the yogis speak about brahman and the par brahman i have not spoken of i mean read the poem on bliss of brahman but par brahman brahman is still an vast impersonal state but beyond is Brahm, par brahman because you can't limit it or define it in brahman you still have brahman and the dance of prakriti or maya but par brahman is that of which no word can be spoken permanent within himself he shadowed being forth which is a younger birth a veil he chose to half conceal him knowledge nothing worth save to have glimpses of its mighty cause so this is a younger birth that mass of superconscient that emerges that's how we see the four states in the upanishads no so we have the virat that outer world and then we have hiranyagar then we have pragya and then we have the turiya so first he describes that turiya state and a younger birth that mass of superconscient light and yet it dissolves into that and high delight a spirit infinite that is the fountain of this glorious world delight that labors in its opposite where is the delight to be found sachidanand that's how we relate with him where is the delight to be found he gives us a very nice a uh, simple beautiful method without charging anything <laughs> delight that labors in its opposite faints in the rose and on the rack is curled any object of this creation go deep within it you'll touch it you can touch wisdom you can touch knowledge you can touch ananda you can touch love you can touch that almighty force that was the truth that uh, india taught to the world that you know you can pick up a stone and realize till the invaders came this is idolatry it's not idolatry anything can become a doorway even human love can reach you to the divine love that was the whole conception of sati the power of love which can even move the stars there are stories of sati and mother speaks of it human beings can love like that that the stars movement was stopped because of somebody's power of love and this lady the story i am forgetting the name of the lady the man is a wretch but she loves him and one day a rishi curses him you are going to die tomorrow morning this is how dare you curse him there will be no morning <laughs> so now all the gods are worried <laughs> they come to anusuya and says what you know she is the master sati what she is now they all will obey that is the power of her you know rishis and this these are not stories and legends that what do we do we are helpless and then she comes and explains to him that you know we understand but you can't stop the whole cosmos because <laughs> of your curse <laughs> then she releases them says provided he takes back there will be no death of him says okay he goes so this was one line of advance it's not like that is the line one has to choose but there are several possibilities that were explored so where all is found in the rose on the rack where else this was the triune playground that he made sachidanand who made this out of home mind life matter is emerged and one there sports a while he plucks his flowers and by his bees is stung he is dismayed flees from himself or has his sullen hours this is the highest realization which comes right at the end and shubindo has got all this before he goes to pondicherry one may wonder what is there now left lot for you to realize and he would say yes i have solved my problem but there is a cosmic problem which i have to solve <laughs> matter must realize it that's how we see the mother toward the end of the agenda she brings this experience in matter 
And she says, ultimately, all is the divine. But it's not an intellectual come far away, far away from that. The Almighty One, new labor, failure, strife, all conceptions are shattered. Oh, God is supporting my venture, but I failed. Is it that He is not supporting my venture? No, He is supporting. Didn't Mother say my blessings are very dangerous? <laughs> she is practical, so she put it. Okay, don't live in abstraction. So she put it, you know, sometimes God's blessing means you will fail. <laughs> so, should we ask for blessings or not? Yes, we must. Why? Because that failure is not failure whom God leads. That is the path to your growth. That's the poem we'll read next. The Almighty One, new labor, failure, strife, knowledge for God, divined itself again. He made an eager death and called it life. He stung himself with bliss and called it pain. So what is bliss? Bliss is, bliss is that wideness where you experience nothing else but the divine, that bliss. What is pain? When we shrink and the contact is very difficult to bear. Intellectually, it is very easy to understand. If you widen yourself intellectually, nothing really can trouble us. There will be different viewpoints, it's fine. Narrow yourself to one idea, turn yourself into a little cult, narrow rigid mind are suffering all the time. That's why when God wants to liberate the narrow rigid minds, He brings along with them Mr. or Mrs. so and so, who will ensure that the mind becomes white. <laughs> All complain has to cease. Otherwise, see how people suffer because of narrowness, conceptions of the divine. Same with the heart. Make the heart narrow, it will suffer. It will suffer from your, even the person who loves you, will be a source of your suffering because your heart is small. But instead of making our heart wide, we want the other person to change. Which The only thing which nobody else can do is to change another person. Even God is struggling since... <laughs> Millenniums, people often come, they say, you know, please explain to our child, no? We want the child to change. I said, see, I can't venture, <laughs> but God even doesn't. <laughs> because we want to, it's not that you cannot, but we want to change according to our conception. That's not what is the way. You have to, the change will be according to the lines that the divine has decided and that will be worked out in life. So he stung himself with bliss and called it pain. And we know that this is uh, one of the experiences of Sri Aurobindo. After all that, you know, this Nirvana, Parbrahman, then he went and he was actually stung by a scorpion. And there was intense pain. And Sri Aurobindo literally looking at it, you know, like Sri Ramakrishna bit by a snake. Kali, what are you doing with me when Sri Aurobindo is stung by that scorpion? He looks at it and Krishna, that's how. That's the way that, you know, path followed. He changed it to bliss. So, now what does he do with his personality, nature? What does a man in nirvana, how does he act, live, do, speak? What does he do? What will he do? He is living in the freedom of the infinite. So, Sri describes this in synthesis. He will do as God directs him. You can't fix a, any rule according to which he must act. It may look very absurd, but that's the truth of the matter. You can't fix him by any mental rule. Why? Because rules are made so that he may transcend. <laughs> now, of course, it's a dangerous doctrine. Of course, climbing mountains is a dangerous thing. But then either you don't climb or you don't. Taste it. Infinity by its nature is that. You can't restrict it into this or that. Somebody asked Shrivindo about uh, human imperfection. He said, that way if you look at it, this whole creation is God, so he is also imperfect. If you look only at the outer nature. But it is changing. That's how. So how does God work? If you look at outwardly, I mean, to explain away, we have created a Satan who comes to fill a Basically blank in our own mind. But who is Satan? Where has he emerged from? He was a being of light who falls. That's all. Why? Because earth is not ready for that. So he comes and says, okay, I labor in the darkness. That's why he says in one of the aphorisms, admire also 
the titans who have taken the poison of the earth after all people who are constantly bitter always you know in pain suffering why admire because there is a quota of suffering in this world quota of bitterness in this world they have said okay we'll absorb it within ourselves and spoil the liver but this is the that's why to shiva the snakes he says no that uh, they have shared my agony and my labor but shurbindo remarks that what shiva does consciously therefore he is a god when you do it unconsciously then you are an asura <laughs> that's the difference <laughs> so the line becomes very thin so what do you do with your nature you can't say ki okay i will act all those standard things are gone oh matra devo bhava pitra devo bhava i'll worship my mother i'll worship my father then it's like tameva mata cha pita tameva tameva bandhu everything is thou whatever way you direct me so i will be as the prayer in the mahabharata that oh keshava you are seated in my heart you move me and he actually moves arjuna if you look at it the whole gita is about that all the standard notions of ethics morality social conduct religious doctrines they are all sent for a toss literally by one word of shri krishna wake up and fight the great battle as the upanishad would put it in a different way in inwardly uttishtata jagrata prapya varani bodhata so arjuna is woken up fight the battle what a command what is he doing people will say blasphemy that's why there are people who mis- say krishna misguided arjuna so people tell me i say it's incomplete truth thanks to his misguidance to arjuna that india and world was saved <laughs> otherwise <laughs> this world would have gone into the blaze of nirvana all the goodies would have gone there paritrana as aduna and duskrita would have been ruling the world <laughs> they would have said very good go to nirvana all of you good guys ah huh? they would have encouraged also like you know all the asuras they don't want people to fight so this no you are a path of nirvana no people say like that the moment india stands for what it believes in they say how can you in a country of non violent people have a bala court incidents how could you do it you are a non violent nation <laughs> so <laughs> but there is also the geeta so we see that state developing in shurbindo when he goes to alipur jail what does he say to the lord he says i don't know i can't see anything so when we can't see anything don't know anything then the best thing is like a little child give over self to the lord tell him direct me i don't understand so that's what we see in this poem surrender but that means a changing of our whole relation with ourselves and with the divine so who am i now i am not mr so and so doctor so and so i am not my visiting card not what people believe me to be not my mama's son my papa's uh, son not somebody sishya all this is gone what am i o thou of whom i am the instrument so this is the stage when the whole life is dedicated to becoming an instrument of god but must understand when you say i am your instrument you say all right he'll not pick up and say okay you are my sword he will take us and throw into the red heat furnace and every time we cry i'll say you asked for being an instrument ha huh, but you have to first you know this raw iron has to change into steel oh oh this is the process yes you want to take back that <laughs> thing about instrument no 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 sir please <laughs> time to time he'll come give a glim smile and say good and his smile is enough then one day the iron has melted and is purified of its dross then it is beaten sharpened and then god says yes you are my instrument so that line conjures many things not just i am your instrument i want to be your instrument he will say are you sure <laughs> then don't tell me how i am going to treat you <laughs> there is a poem by tagore no that uh, he whom he wants to bear the burden of his universal love so what does he do 
एके बारे सबई ओके घोचाए दाए तार से ही टेक्स अवे एवरीथिंग ऑफ हिज टेयर्स अवे ऑल हिज क्लोथ्स ही मेक्स हिम अकिंचन नथिंग बिलोंग्स टू हिम देन व्हाट डज ही डू ही पुट्स हिम स्ट्रेट ऑन द मिडिल ऑफ द रोड नो ड्रेस नो हाउस नथिंग and then he says now you are ready to bear the burden of my universal love so o thou whom i am the instrument o secret spirit and nature housed in me let all my mortal being now be blent in thy still glory of divinity so after that liberation that permanent he returns to the fields of nature and offers it this is the experience he will described in the dual being the one of the first experiences of this yoga where there is a separation between the liberated inner self doesn't matter with what term we use it witness spirit and the nature field outside we don't abandon it it is offered i have given my mind to be dug thy channel mind i don't know lord i can't understand anything but you know everything shri ramakrishna is that famous thing no he said how do you know so much when ishwar chand vidya sagar was coming to meet him his name is vidya sagar so he said when he came to meet him he said are the ocean of knowledge has come to me vidya sagar i am just a little nalla that you know little drain he says sir when ocean has filled the drain there is no more drain anywhere <laughs> i am only a namesake sagar but you are the real ocean and i come to bow to you and he said that i don't know anything i am an illiterate person he would confess it so how are you speaking when you read through the gospel of shri ramakrishna it's amazing and shri bindu says right through the power of intuition he would touch the truth and he said i don't know kali just let me know what has to be known everything vedanta tantra you read that wonderful book that uh, he didn't write anything but what a penetrating depth deep insight he would just had developed so i have given my mind to be dug thy channel mind so to be dug means be plastic and white divine channel mind cannot be narrow rigid hard Yes, make me your instrument. I have given my mind to surrender to the plus, but please conform to my conceptions of what you are. Don't ask me to lift a bow and arrow and shoot. That I won't do because I don't believe in a God who can ask me to shoot. Don't ask me to abandon this, abandon that. I must do all that I am doing, but make my mind an instrument. Pour your knowledge according to traditional Vedanta. God will say, "Wait. <laughs> I have given my mind to be dug thy channel mind. The worst kind of mind for this is scholarly mind, because it has read too much, too many things. And He will say, 'Where do I begin? <laughs> I have to dig a channel.' <laughs> That's why Sri Ramakrishna said again, 'There is hope for two kinds of people: the unlettered peasant.'" and the pandit who after reading everything still feels it is not enough because then he surrenders i have read all this but it doesn't make sense so these two people so he says i have given my mind to be dug thy channel mind i have offered up my will to be thy will no more my personal desire karna fakiri phir kya dil lagi ri sada magan mein rehna ji let nothing of myself be left behind in our union mystic and un utterable so yoga is union with the divine in one sentence shobindo's yoga and traditional yoga yoga is union with the divine traditional yoga is union of the soul with the divine atma with parmatma shobindo's yoga is along with that union the union of nature with the divine supernature that explains shobindo's yoga but union of nature with the divine supernature complete surrender shobindo says surrender to the infinite mother is the real you know no this yoga cannot be done without that the key word is surrender beginning journey and path and the goal is surrender the plenty of letters to that effect my heart shall throb with the world beats of thy love i don't want any more those cabin compartmentalized human love but i want the world beats of thy love my body become thy engine for arthios what a wonderful line this is what is our body used for all or actually 
the right word for our body is not used abused that's how when he looks at uh, all the people in the jail he says even in those darkened minds and misused bodies he sees narayana now misused bodies bodies used for all kinds of purposes which are full of you know selfish gains so he says no let only your will use my body in my nerves and veins thy rapture streams shall move that ananda my thoughts shall be hounds of light for thy part to lose hounds of light is literally intuition sarma the hound of heaven so my thought should be no more that laboring mental thought but hounds of light intuitive rays and what these intuitive rays will do they will be vehicles for your power to radiate upon earth so that's what he gives up his body will heart mind nerves veins keep wonderful line it is keep only my soul to adore eternally see the bhakta will never want that kind of merger where he vanishes that joy is gone once that union is accomplished he wants that no no let's have the joy of that play of love merger back like that he plays with the lord and the lord enjoys it that love and joy can continue indefinitely and infinitely so bhakta chooses like that he will not like okay now i vanish into you he will fulfill the purpose for which the individual soul has come into existence if he completely merges and vanishes into lay then it is gone so he says adore eternally keep only my soul to adore eternally where in which temple how do we adore him eternally by going within by going to a particular temple he says keep only my soul to adore eternally and this marvelous line and meet thee in each form and soul of thee o worshipper of the formless infinite reject not form what dwells in form is he it's very vast so we can see through this surrender his being is growing into a cosmic consciousness it follows a logic it's not like he had a nirvana then suddenly he had the vasudevam sarvamiti he depend that experience from there advaita then the passive and dynamic side are coming together and then that nirvana deepens into parbrahman but he also discovered that parbrahman is all these things objects all these letterings are he and then when the nature is surrendered and the soul refuses that lay it can but refuses it then what happens then you begin to experience the divine consciousness the working presence in everything so there is a vastness which is growing then this vastness leads to the realization of vasudevam sarvamiti which we'll speak about next time through some of the poems namaste